Today we're going to play a game of 20 questions with Dr. Cliff Olson. Welcome, this is episode 15 of the Pure Tinnitus and Hearing Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Cliff. In 2017, Dr. Cliff Olson opened Applied Hearing Solutions in Anthem, Arizona. Around the same time, he started his YouTube channel, Dr. Cliff AUD, to educate consumers on their hearing loss treatment options and the importance of hearing aid best practices. Dr. Cliff, we're going to get right into this game. What audiology project of yours are you most proud of and why? Question number one. Boy, I mean, there's been a lot of projects. If, if I was forced to pick one, I would probably say that it's uh, it's my network, the, the Best Practice Pro Network, which actually started as the Dr. Cliff AUD Approved Provider Network. And the whole focus of the network is for me to provide some kind of vetting for hearing care professionals who follow best practices. So uh, individuals with hearing loss can actually find a hearing care professional that does basically the same stuff that I do in my clinic out here in the Phoenix, Arizona area. So uh, something that uh, took a while to kind of uh, like create. And then, you know, we've had it since around the end of 2019 is when we launched it. And we're up to about, I don't know, 80, 90 providers throughout uh, the United States and Canada at this point. That's fantastic. Okay, we're playing 20 questions with Dr. Cliff. Question number two, when is buying hearing aids online a bad idea? Um, only when you're buying them from a company that is not actually selling you what they're telling you they're selling you and then make it uh, extremely difficult for you to get your money back. You know, one of the common themes that you see online is that they say, oh, you get the same hearing aids that you can get inside of a, a hearing clinic and you can get them for like one tenth of the price and there's a money back guarantee and you can use them for a hundred days and, and, and all of that. And if they don't work, send them back. Um, all of those are just scams. And, and unfortunately, they continue to work, which is the problem. Um, but outside of that, I mean, I think that any form of hearing treatment is, is really beneficial no matter where you want to start at with your hearing journey. Just understand that if you end up not having success with hearing treatment going the online route, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't get treatment if you had some professional assistance. Great. And number, question number three ties into that. Uh, when is buying hearing aids online a good idea? Yeah, I mean, it, here's the thing. There is accessibility issues inside of the hearing healthcare world, specifically with hearing aids, whether it, you don't live close enough to a clinic to be able to uh, get care, whether you literally just cannot afford professional care. I mean, are your options are basically to go online, find something more accessible, more, uh, more affordable for you, or not do anything. And quite frankly, I feel like the not doing anything is where most people end up going uh, and so if it's between those two options, I would, I would strongly encourage someone to go online and purchase, whether it's a hearing aid online or whether it's just a, an over-the-counter amplifier online. Fantastic. Totally agree. Question number four, in your opinion, what has been the biggest development in hearing aid technology in the past two years? Past two years. Wow. Um, yeah, so there's been a lot of big stuff that has come out since I even got into the profession, which was 2012. And I say into the profession, meaning I started grad school in 2012. But here in the last two years, you know, I think that things have kind of slowed down a little bit, uh, not in the sense that technology hasn't advanced, but, you know, switching from analog to digital hearing aids that we saw like back in 1996, you know, having Bluetooth enter the hearing aid world back in 2014 was really big. And I honestly think that um, right now, and something we just saw was this incorporation of like different artificial intelligence, machine learning, and then deep neural networks inside of hearing aids. And I really think that some form of artificial intelligence is really going to start uh, changing the way that we approach uh, treating hearing loss. And, and that all of that has really started to hit here in the past two years. Very nice. All right, question number five. If you had a family member, aunt, uncle, mom, dad, grandparent, who needed hearing aids, uh, what would you recommend to them? What kind of devices, if they came to your clinic, what would you recommend to them? Man, really depends on which family member it is and what they found to be important, because that's the thing. Everyone wants to know, oh, well, Cliff, you know, what's the best hearing aid out there? And I always answer the same way. It depends on what your wants and needs are. So, you know, to kind of pigeonhole uh, one of my family members into a certain brand that might not work for somebody else in my family, 
I, I would have to say I literally have no idea. Yeah, and, and that brings in the importance of being able to talk with a professional to get these questions answered because there's so many factors at play. All right, we're five questions in. It's 20 questions with Dr. Cliff, 15 more questions to go. This is fun. We wanted to do this new style of engagement on this podcast episode. So question number six, Cliff, how will the over-the-counter hearing aid act affect the hearing health industry? And if you could give us a little context of the over-the-counter hearing aid act too. Yeah, so over-the-counter hearing aid act is something that was signed into law back in 2017. And then we were expecting to see guidelines, you know, in 2020 uh, released by the FDA to kind of outline what an over-the-counter hearing aid is. To, because to be quite honest with you, even like we have no clue what an over-the-counter hearing aid is. Now we have context of what an actual hearing aid is, what a direct-to-consumer amplifier or hearing aid is at this point, but we really don't know uh, specifically what the over-the-counter hearing aid category is defined as. And so, you know, to, to try to, I guess, guess what that is going to be and how it will ultimately affect the world of hearing treatment, I would have to assume that they're going to be fairly decent devices. And I think that there are a lot of individuals who are just crossing their fingers and waiting and hoping for those guidelines to be released. So within the next, you know, six to 12 months after they're released, we actually start seeing a significant amount of these devices hit the market. And so kind of like I talked about before, individuals who want to treat their hearing loss, but have accessibility and affordability issues, that's really who these devices are geared towards serving. And so from that context, I think it's, it's really good for overall hearing treatment. That also could be potentially a stepping stone to actually going into a clinic and getting professional care, you know, kind of get your feet wet, so to speak, before jumping in uh, to the deep end of the pool with, with full-on treatment. Um, but I also think there's, there's a double-edged sword uh, side of this, that there's potential that people could think that an over-the-counter hearing aid would be completely suitable for their hearing loss, and then they don't have success with that device, and that no treatment will help them which usually is not the case. I mean, when you start looking at no matter what type of hearing loss somebody has, there is always a treatment option for it. You know, so whether it's a conductive loss that you have, a bone anchored hearing aid, a, uh, you know, a traditional sensory neural hearing loss that, that requires hearing aid to, to help benefit. If you have really poor word recognition ability with a hearing aid, you start looking at cochlear implants. If you don't have an effective auditory nerve to send sound from your cochlea, your hearing organ, to your brain, there are auditory brainstem implants. So there's always a treatment option. The question is, are you going to try something without having any you know, expertise in the area yourself and call it quits if it doesn't work for you? Yeah, it's so the over-the-counter hearing aid act. We had uh, Dr. Amin Amlani, PhD, who was on one of our earlier episodes. He predicted that due to COVID, the delay for them releasing the guidelines, that he predicted it would come out around this time next year, early 2022. So we'll monitor that and see what's going on there. Question number seven, Dr. Cliff, what is the difference between currently available hearables and the soon-to-be-released over-the-counter hearing aids? And, uh, and additionally, when there are over-the-counter hearing aids, will they? do you think they'll be labeled as such? And will there still be online hearing aids sold that don't meet that criteria? Or will it regulate everything that if it's sold uh, in that capacity, it has to meet that criteria? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I, I, I don't think from a reg regulatory perspective that there's going to be a whole lot of change. I think that, you know, the OTC hearing aid is kind of more of like a buzzword. And uh, there's mm -hmm. going to companies that they try to cash in on that buzzword but I don't think it's gonna you're gonna have a hearing aid that's that's massively different than what you can actually get already online so uh, and we already know that the FDA isn't doing anything to uh, really stop companies from saying that they're selling over-the-counter hearing aids right now in fact you know anytime that a company is brought to the attention of the FDA and I've seen this personally they send out a letter saying oh well we already sent letters out to the manufacturers telling them they couldn't. But basically what that means is like, well, yeah, they're doing it, but we're just not gonna enforce it. So, I mean, it, it's everybody's best guess as to what will actually happen, what these devices will look like, will they be any different from a hearable or not? Yeah, totally with you. And question, okay, question number eight, let's say a patient comes into your clinic or any clinic here in the US and they agree that they need hearing aids to treat their hearing loss. 
but their budget is only around a maximum around amount of around two thousand dollars twenty five hundred dollars how do you counsel that patient right now given that there are online options but there are also affordable hearing aids from a clinic and there are other options through donation etc so how do you counsel that patient yeah, there's there, if you have two thousand dollars, you actually have a better workable budget to treat your hearing loss professionally than you really think that you do. Um, I guarantee you that in every that like major you know city in in the at least North America that there is a place that you can go with two thousand dollars and get legitimate hearing aids and have those hearing aids fit professionally. Now they probably won't come with an exorbitant amount of of follow up care. You won't get the best hearing aids in existence but you'll probably get better devices and, and perform better with those than what you could if you're just trying to find like an over-the-counter type amplifier, right? So um, I would say that there's, there's plenty of options. Now, in, inside of my clinic, specifically speaking, this is one area that, that we don't really uh, serve as much because there is such a demand for people who want the absolute best when it comes to hearing performance and unfortunately, that does require a lot of time from a hearing care provider, which is what we do. We spend a ton of time with patients just getting their treatment exactly right. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you can't uh, have $2,000 go a long way in terms of getting you some quality care. Amazing. That's great. All right, we're going to switch it up to your YouTube channel, Dr. Cliff AUD. Question number nine, Cliff, what do you believe is your most underrated YouTube video? Underrated YouTube video, man, boy. Um, let me think here. There, so the, it's the funny thing is, there's I've got like over 400 videos at this point on my YouTube channel, and to try to kind of pick the one of the worst performers that I think is one of the best videos is really hard to do. Like uh, you know, the ones that I talk about realer measurement, those are the ones that get all the fanfare, right? Because it's something that's very specific to help you improve almost immediately when it comes to hearing performance. But the, the funny thing is, is that one of my worst performing videos is the, what is an audiologist video? Yeah. And, which is kind of funny, but like, uh, I think of that as an incredibly important video for you to actually understand what is an audiologist, what makes them uh, different than other types of providers that are out there, uh, both in the medical world and non-medical world. Um, and yet nobody's searching for what an audiologist is. So it seems like we have a lot more work to do there. Yeah, personally, I've been really inspired by your your progress and your your history with the YouTube channel. I remember a few years ago, first learning about you. I even used your video to help educate one of my patients while he was waiting in the office for me working on his hearing aids to simply watch your video instead of just wait uh, and do nothing on his phone. So from even years back, thank you for for making all this amazing content. Question number 10, I think this is related to your YouTube presence. What is the farthest distance that a patient has traveled to see you in person in Arizona? Um, I don't know the distance, but uh, Bermuda is, so when someone has like a, they have their permanent residence in Bermuda and they, tra which I don't know, thousands of miles away requires a, a flight and all of that to come out and see me. Um, I have had people from, over like overseas in the sense of like Europe come and get treatment from me, but uh, they were uh, relocated, you know, to the United States or were they're here on vacation. I wasn't the primary reason they were coming, but uh, we're starting to see a lot more of that. I get people who who travel in long distance to see me uh, very regular regularly at this point. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating the reach of YouTube and how these videos are reaching so many people that there's there's a family in Bermuda that says, I want to see this guy and I want to treat my hearing loss. It's pretty cool. Okay. Question number 11. What was the hardest thing about starting your new audiology clinic and more recently moving into a, an actual new physical location? Well, the hardest thing about it is just sticking with it and dealing with all the mistakes that happen along the way. Uh, some mistakes that are your fault, my fault, uh, some mistakes that are the fault of maybe the, the contractors and the people that you hire to do it. But, you know, the project was supposed to be like a, a five month project. It ended up being like a, a 14 month project. So, I mean, it's just it, it, 
just sticking with it the whole entire time and not letting it affect your day-to-day -day from treating patients in a clinic. But uh, just a quick shout out to, to my wife, Ashley Olson. If it wasn't for her, I still would not be in the new clinic. So if she didn't kind of clamp down on the contractors and make sure everything got done the right way, it probably still wouldn't be done. That's really nice. And I appreciate, as a viewer of your channel, right? I appreciate how you brought in your family, how you brought in Ashley. Uh, and everyone loved those videos. I think people like to learn about the, the you know, the person, Dr. Cliff, not just the professional. So that was really nice. Okay, we're playing 20 questions with Dr. Cliff. Next question, question 12. Do DIY, do, your, do it yourself, earwax removal kits work? I know you've reviewed some of the most popular ones. They tend to get a lot of views on your channel. Do those kits work? Man, you know, I just, I can't get them to work very well, if at all. I, I don't know what it is. Like, trust me. So everyone thinks I'm super biased against this because we do professional earwax removal in the clinic. And, you know, there's not, I mean, I, I think doing earwax removal is, is fun to a degree, but by no mean do I make like a, a killing on it in terms of financially, like I couldn't, I couldn't support my family on the, on the earwax removal, uh, uh, earwax removals that we do in the clinic. And so, you know, anytime I do a review of like ear candling or, you know, the, the wax blaster 5,000 or whatever that's called. Right. Um, and then, you know, doing like the, the visual otoscopes where you can go in and dig your own earwax out. I've not been successful with any of those or have had anyone who could remove their wax even remotely close as to effective as what you can have it done professionally. So uh, do they work? Maybe for some people they work. I just can't get it to the point where they work on the people that we're, we're trying to get it to be effective with and nothing would make me happier than to identify a surefire, this product works for everybody and I don't have to remove earwax ever again so I can focus on treating hearing loss and tinnitus. <laughs> oh man, I get a kick of seeing how those videos have the most views and you know, clearly there's a, there's a desire to get, there, people love earwax and there's a desire to remove it on your own. Um, my next question, question number 13. Looking through your community tab in YouTube, and you made a post, quote, I'm looking to fly an ear candling expert out to Phoenix to help me conduct an experiment testing the effectiveness of ear candles on removing earring wax, end quote. Is there any update on this project? No, no one's willing to come out. I will <laughs> pay for someone to fly out here. I will put them up in the nicest, like I live across the street from a, a, a Hilton hotel. I'll put them up in the Hilton. Uh, we will go, we will do experiments, we'll record all of it and post it on social media. And, you know, because here's the concern, right? The concern is, is that, well, Cliff, you just don't know how to do it right with your candle. And I'm like, that's fine. If, if, if it's me, it's me. But please, somebody out there, if someone's listening right now who swears by ear candling and you know that it's effective, I will fly you out here and you can show me how to do it. And we will document the whole thing and show how effective it is. I want to personally help find this person, Cliff. I want to personally help fly this person to Phoenix. And maybe, who knows, maybe it starts their own YouTube ear candling channel from it. It could easily spawn into that. We'll, we'll see if that happens. Question 14, we're going to switch it up. That was fun. Talk about your channel. I'll talk about these earwax videos. Question 14, just about six more left. Cliff, do you have tinnitus and does it impact your life? So I have tinnitus in my right ear. Uh, I've had it for a long time. And when I joined the military back in 2002, one, uh, I actually failed my hearing test in my right ear. So I have a, a very odd looking cookie bite hearing loss. It's about 65 decibels at its worst at 2000 Hertz. And, and then it kind of ends up recovering back for these, these adjacent frequencies. But um, they asked me if I had any ringing in my ears and I'm like, oh, well, isn't that just what a, a quiet room sounds like? It just has a ring to it. And so like, I was unaware that this ringing that I had experienced, like, all, apparently for a long time was actually a condition called tinnitus. And the thing is, is that I've really habituated to it to the point where it doesn't really bother me a whole lot anymore, except for one circumstance, which is when I'm trying to fall asleep at night. If I'm trying to fall asleep in a completely silent room um, that, that doesn't have a lot of other noise or sound going on in it, that ringing gets so loud that I'm just like, that's the only thing I can focus on. 
So I, I consistently do a couple of things. I sleep with a fan on when I'm at home. So the sound of the fan really drowns out the sound of the tinnitus really well for me. And then I like using the sleep buds as well. So the sleep buds are a product by Bose. They, they will generate you know, different types of sounds, uh, nature sounds, other types of sounds that can drown out the tinnitus as well. I like to travel with those. It broke my heart when the first version of those uh, got discontinued. And then I was like the most excited person in the world when the second version of them came out that fixed a lot of the kinks with the first one. So um, it has affected my life, but through you know careful management of it, it doesn't have a negative impact anymore. Thank you so much. And for anyone listening in the pure tinnitus community, those Bose sleep buds, and there's now a new generation, that's something that I learned about through your video, Cliff. And that's something that I'm happy you're bringing if anyone's watching. Do consider incorporating that into the nightly routine, the sound therapy options for how to manage tinnitus at night. You mentioned your military experience. Question number 16, what is one lesson you learned from your years in the military that maybe affects how you communicate with patients uh, today? And, and I've actually said this before, my military experience, uh, I served as a Marine Corps scout sniper and, and everything about what you do as a scout sniper is about fundamentals and precision. And that translates very heavily into the field of audiology. And I don't care which area you specialize in, Inside of audiology, I happen to work primarily with hearing aids, you know, adult amplification, but there are certain fundamentals that we should be following, and those fundamentals are best practices, right? Those, those procedures that we do that have been shown by research to achieve the highest level of outcomes uh, for individuals who, using amplification. And the other side of that is the precision in which you apply those fundamentals, apply those best practices is very critical. And, Military, if you don't follow the fundamentals and you don't follow those fundamentals with precision, people die. If you don't follow the fundamentals with precision in audiology, people do not achieve their highest level of outcome. And sometimes they achieve no benefit at all. So I would say that those are, are really the core things that I brought from my military experience into my profession of audiology. Yeah, that's great. Question number 17, is there anything you have done in audiology that has pushed you out of your comfort zone. One thing you've done really well with your blogs is show your human side, that you're not simply a doctor who only talks about technology, that you have personal life, that you have emotions, that you, you have challenges, you have frustrations. So this question here, I feel like we'll get to, into some of that. Is there anything in audiology that has pushed you out of your comfort zone or towards the very edge of your comfort zone? Boy, you know, one thing I've learned about myself is that I don't confine myself by my comfort. Um, you know, I, I make mistakes when I treat patients. Um, I learn from those mistakes. In fact, I even tell my staff that there's no such thing as a mistake as long as you learn from it, right? They all, they're all learning experiences. And so, you know, through, up through my, my upbringing in audiology, I mean, I had an opportunity to see a lot of different aspects of audiology from the vestibular balance side to cochlear implants, to other surgical procedures to correct hearing loss, uh, to amplification with hearing aids, to dealing with and managing tinnitus, working with veterans, working with children, working with adults. Um, you know, and, and I would say that every single one of them pushed me outside of a relative comfort zone, but that's how we learn and grow. And the one thing that I learned from all of those different areas of audiology is that there are some amazing hearing care professionals who are working in all of those realms. And I need to let them do their thing because I have one uh, singular focus that I've identified as a strength for me. And that's particularly working you know, with, with hearing loss, working with the hearing loss in adults and working particularly with adult amplification. And so you know, uh, all of the areas that I felt uncomfortable with if I feel like I can't perform in those areas as well as other individuals, I need to kind of stay in my lane. <laughs> really nice. Yeah, this idea of the comfort zone, uh, it's very relevant to tinnitus because those who are really challenged by tinnitus, bothersome tinnitus, maybe would consider themselves suffering from tinnitus. Uh, there's worries, there's concern, there's anxiety, there's fear, there's a lot of unknown. Um, so that comfort zone of reaching that edge, trying something new, uh, pushing ourselves to a degree, very relevant in the work that I do. So thanks for sharing that. 
Question 18, we have a few more questions here out of these 20 questions with Dr. Cliff. Questions, question number 18, what is your hunch or what is your analysis of the research about the long-term effectiveness of pharmaceutical drug solutions to regrow outer hair cells? You can mention frequency therapeutics or any other relevant research. Yeah, so when you talk about long-term effectiveness, we really don't know. And quite honestly, we're still trying to figure out the short-term efficacy of any of these drugs to be effective whatsoever. And I know that both from the hearing loss community and the tinnitus community, that they are really hoping that hair cell regeneration, uh, no matter who comes up with it, um, is, is an effective solution for both of those things. And unfortunately, at this point, it's almost too early to call it. Now, we have seen some really interesting research from these companies suggesting that these drugs are safe to use. Whether they're safe to use long term, we don't know. Um, whether you can get treated with them at one you know, time period in your life and have a long lasting effect of that benefit, we don't know. And we ultimately don't know if they're going to do what they're hopefully going to do, which is have a significant amount of hair cell regrowth that will uh, reduce the amount of auditory deprivation that we have that could be facilitating tinnitus as well. And you know, I, I think we're all hoping that it has some benefit and we just don't know what that is right now. But, but I would tell you this, there are people out there who are a lot smarter than you or me who are researching this stuff and, and they're eventually going to find a solution to this. You just gotta give them enough time. In the meantime, we have to figure out ways to, to try to manage whatever we have going on, whether it's your hearing loss, whether it's your tinnitus, whether it's something else until that point. But we should all feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel at this point. Yeah, great points. Something that comes up so often is these drug solutions. And you know, I, I would say someone with hearing loss, if they're hopeful that the drug solution works for them, they're still going to wear hearing aids because it's quite evident the effect. With tinnitus, I would say it's more multifactorial and variable uh, and a little more complex about where to start and what are some realistic uh, marginal gains to improve the symptom or improve the experience with it. But still, I completely agree with you. It's very in line with the messaging I have to this pure tinnitus community of, yes, we're all monitoring any sort of new technology, bimodal stimulation or pharmaceutical drugs. But in the meantime, let's do what we can. Let's learn about what can be done or how can we best manage this. Completely agree with you. We're going to switch into some of your uh, your prime discussion topics here, real ear measures and audiology hearing aid fittings. Question number 19, what are some what are the most important factors for a successful hearing aid fitting and where yeah, let's start with that. What are some important factors for a successful hearing aid fitting? Yeah, so I've talked about best practices on a previous question, but for those of us out there listening that, that don't understand what best practices are, it's there are a whole bunch of different processes and procedures that must be followed in order to achieve the highest level outcome with hearing treatment. And I mean, it, to pick one of them being more important than the other, you almost can't do it because every single one of them ultimately matters and can be in its own way, either detrimental to successful hearing treatment or have a negative impact on hearing treatment. But you know, when I first started my channel, I talked a lot about the low hanging fruit of best practices, which is uh, real ear measurement. So real ear measurement is basically a way to verify that a hearing aid has been programmed correctly to somebody's hearing loss prescription. And if you don't, have real ear measurement done when your hearing aids are being programmed for your hearing loss, you really have no clue what's going on uh, in terms of amplification and in terms of if you're getting enough audibility to overcome your hearing loss. So to even consider moving past real ear measurement to do any of the other best practices almost makes everything else uh, somewhat inconsequential. Now, I don't wanna discount the idea that using a, a person-centered or person or, or patient-centered care approach to hearing treatment, where you actually look at the wants and needs of an individual and incorporate them in the decision-making process of, of how you go about treating them. I don't want to discount that. But at the end of the day, if you may, I tell my patients all the time, if I make one mistake or I do something incorrectly with hearing treatment, then that is going to have a cascade of negative events that occur and ultimately the, the patient doesn't achieve their highest level outcome. 
So I can't necessarily say that, that one is more important than the other, but if I was really forced to, I would say that we really need to be doing verification and validation measures on patients who are being treated. Use technology to make sure how we're fitting them work and then validate the effectiveness for that individual. Question number 20, we've been to 20. Would you, knowing everything you know, would you prefer to get, in, imagine you're a patient getting hearing aids, would you prefer to get hearing aids from a hearing aid dispenser or an instrument specialist using real ear measures or an audiologist without using real ear measures? Dispenser using real ear measures, right? Great. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. And this is, so this is kind of the hang up for a lot of, of individuals who don't like me, you know, inside of my own profession is that, you know, I think that best practice care and person-centered care is more important than whatever degree you hold, to be quite honest with you. Now, there are fantastic uh, dispensers, there are fantastic audiologists, there are some pretty crummy dispensers, and there are some pretty crummy audiologists. But at the end of the day, if I could at least identify if someone was going to perform a core fundamental procedure that needs to be done to ensure that I achieve maximum benefit, I'm going to go to the person who does that. Now, when I'm done going to them, I might, if they're bad at everything else, I might choose to also go somewhere else and have them do other things to optimize my treatment. But at the end of the day, you got to have that done at a bare minimum. Yeah. And just so everyone listening, who knows? Those are not your only options. You can see an audiologist using real ear measures. You can find a hearing instrument specialist in your local town who uses real ear measures. Dr. Cliff, we have a bonus question. Tell us about where someone can find you and potentially sign up for your provider network. Yeah, so uh, you can find me on YouTube. All you have to do is type in anything hearing related, most likely, and you'll see one of my videos pop up. Um, if you want to go actually check out my channel, it's Dr. Cliff AUD. Um, you can find my website, which is drcliffaud.com. You can find me on LinkedIn as Dr. Cliff Olson. You can find me on Twitter. I'm not really big into Instagram, so don't try to hit me up there. Um, but, you know, so if you're, if you're an individual who has hearing loss, there's a lot of resources out there for you on all of those platforms. And I specifically, I'm speaking to you as a consumer primarily when I'm making these videos. I want you to be well informed. So even if you don't come and receive treatment from me, you know what to better expect from a, a different hearing care professional to make sure that you get the best care humanly possible. For providers who may be listening to this, if you want to be a part of the Best Practice Pro Network, which is my network of hearing care professionals who are committed to following best practices and acting in patients' best interest, you can head over to audiologyacademy.com and take my webinar. You can get CEUs from that webinar, and it outlines all of the criteria in order to be able to join the network. Thanks so much, Cliff. How did that 20 questions go for you? Uh, pretty good, to be quite honest with you. I mean, um, you know, I, uh, some of them made me feel really uncomfortable, but I somehow pulled through. That's good. And yeah, this is a little different than a typical interview style, right? Because these were rapid fire, boom, 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 one after the other. Is there any other message you have for the Pure Tinnitus community here? We're going to end our session. First of all, thank you for being here. Thanks for making time in your schedule. And uh, we, yeah, we really wish you and your family and your clinic and your whole staff uh, successful 2021 and moving forward. Do you have any messages for the Pure Tinnitus community to wrap it up? Yeah, I would think specifically for your community. I know that everybody's looking for the solution and the cure to, for tinnitus, to be quite honest with you. And, and oftentimes hearing loss and tinnitus go hand in hand, um, but there's usually something out there that will have a beneficial effect for everybody. And mindset comes into this a lot. Uh, I, I regularly do you know, uh, consultations, remote consultations for individuals who are really struggling with tinnitus. And a lot of it is, is that you have to reframe your mind on how you're perceiving the tinnitus. And even though there might not be the perfect cure right now that completely gets rid of your tinnitus and you can go on living your life without hearing that annoying ringing or buzzing sound inside of your ears. I mean, I'm a perfect example. I have tinnitus and it bothers me almost none because I figured out ways to manage it in ways that help me. But the ways that help me might not help you. Doesn't mean that you can't find something that does though. So I would say, keep on the journey, talk with other people, find out what works with them, you know, learn from Ben and his content, this is great stuff. And, and you'll eventually find a way to, to cope with 
and manage your tinnitus in a way that allows you to live your life the best you can. Thank you so much, Cliff. Thank you to everyone watching. Make sure to subscribe if you're listening to this podcast. Comment if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, and I'll do my best to respond personally. Thanks again, Cliff. Thank you.